All right, guys, our next speaker today, which I'm sure you're all very excited to hear, is Shane Legg. He's from New Zealand, where he trained in math and classical ballet. He got his PhD in Switzerland in theoretical models of machine superintelligence, and he's here to talk to us today about a very interesting topic measures of machine intelligence. Shane Legg. All right. So. I am going to begin my talk with uh, the standard thing for uh, people at Singularity Summit. I'm going to start by showing you an exponential graph. So most of you will have seen this before, but even though I've seen this a lot of times before, I sort of need to remind myself again and again and again of sort of how insane this is. Because it's sort of, it's almost terrifying. So let me just run it through for some of the people who haven't seen this before. Okay, so down the bottom we've got the years. Up here we've got the number of calculations per second. And these are supercomputers. This is the biggest computer in the world at each point in time. Um, and these points are the performance of the supercomputers over time. Now this is a logarithmic scale. So every time you go up one of these lines, you're going up by a factor of 10. So it's going up 10. 100, 1,000, 10,000, all the way through millions, billions, trillions, and all the way up there, right? So this is just absolutely steaming along through the powers, right? And it's actually, as you can see, curving upwards on an exponential graph. That's just completely nuts. Now, this is where we are at the moment. Where are we going? So if you look, talk to the uh, people who run the biggest supercomputing conference in the world, they think that we should arrive at about this point at about that point in time. That's sort of the general consensus. Now, I want you to think a little bit further out than that. I'm going to go 15 years. This is not, um, you know, this is, I'm not talking 50, 100, or something in the far, far distant future here. We're talking 15 years. It's, there's nothing, you know, too, too far out. But what does this actually mean? 10 to the power of 20. It's a very hard thing to sort of get your mind around what that would mean. So there are two, two statistics I quite like. Somebody tried working out how many grains of sand there are on all the beaches in the whole world. Not just at the surface, but right down to the bedrock, above the shoreline, and down into the water. They worked it out at between 10 to the 20 and 10 to the 21. That many calculations per second. Here's another statistic, 10 to the 20. If you look at the number of neurons in the human brain, the most recent statistic I've seen about 85 billion, worked out last year by somebody, you multiply that up by the number of people. This is about the number of neurons in every human brain on Earth. That many calculations per second. This is completely insane. Now, while this is completely insane, there's, there's something that I find very unsatisfying about this. Because, great, we're getting faster and faster and faster computers. So we can work out all the spreadsheets in the world in a nanosecond or something, right? Okay. But what does that actually, what does that translate into that's, that's really, really meaningful? What I want to know is actually, is, I, I want a graph like this. What I want to see is not, is not time, uh, uh, time over here, great. Uh, what I want to see on this axis is the actual intelligence. Because, great, we've gone from computers that can play chess at this level to that level or, or whatever else. Um, but are machines actually becoming more intelligent? Some people say yes, some people say no. It's not really clear. We know they're getting a lot faster at doing computations, but are, are we actually going forwards in terms of general intelligence? So I want to see this graph. I want to know where we're going. So. This set me off on a, a bit of an odyssey. Um, in my quest to answer what I think is one of the most fundamental questions in artificial intelligence, which is we need a concept of what intelligence is, and we need a way to measure it in order to produce a graph like that and know where we're going. And in the process, I learned a few things. And one of the things I learned eventually, after a long time actually, was something that's in the first pages of Russell and Norvig which is the standard textbook on artificial intelligence. And I'm going to tell it to you because I think it's something that's not 
appreciated enough. And I think it's a good starting point for thinking about intelligence. So the first question, I think, when, you're, when, you, wanna, when you wanna think about what is intelligence, you need to ask yourself, is it, are you going for something that's essentially modeled on human? Or are you going for something that's more ideal, more of a normative model? Some, you might, it might be rationality, it might be optimal, or, or whatever, however you want to define it. And so there's a, there's a fundamental sort of distinction here. What's, what's sort of your target? Is it this, this your humanity, is that kind of your model? Or is it something that's more optimal or rational or something like that? And you don't necessarily want to replicate cognitive biases that humans have or something like this. And there's reasons why you might want to want to go either way. Okay, so the next question is, are you concerned with internal properties of the system? So for example, whether the system has thought, or whether it has emotions, understanding, consciousness, imagination, neurons, it could be, a, it could be like a substrate thing. Maybe you think that you have to have neurons to be intelligent. Um, a soul, you could, you could put a whole lot of things in this category. And then the other, right. um, the other possibility is that maybe you really just con are concerned with external behavior. So if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, you don't care it's got pipes inside. You just want something that acts like a duck. So this is, a, this is sort of a fundamental distinction here. And so we can, we can look at, um, a quadrant, and we can look at these two questions. So we've got the first one, human versus some sort of ideal, and then internal properties and external behavior. So the first um, guy I'm putting up here is Alan Turing, with a famous Turing test, where if you can act enough like a human, then presumably you must be intelligent. And so he's not concerned with the internal properties here, he's concerned with the behavior, and he's taking the human as the as, as what you're trying to, you know, that, that's sort of your, your goal in a sense, right? Okay, another possibility, um, we have Marcus Hooter down here. Now I should say that in each of these quadrants, there are, there are many different opinions. I'm just putting one sort of somewhat representative kind of guy who's quite well known there. Um, so here, he developed a model called AIC, which is provably universally optimal in some technical sense and things like this. It's work I did in my, uh, I worked with him in my PhD. Um, and so he's concerned with external behavior, but in some ideal kind of sense, okay? Another possibility is you're concerned with the internal property. So this is John Searle and his Chinese room argument, where you have a room, and you have somebody in there, and they take in Chinese symbols, and they follow certain rules and pass out Chinese symbols. They have no idea of Chinese, but from the outside, it looks like the room is behaving like it understands Chinese, even though there's no real understanding in there. So he would argue that that system is not really intelligent. And so he's concerned with internal properties, not just the external behavior. And there's other philosophers in that category, Ned Block and a number of other famous ones. And then possibly in the last one, I was, I was thinking about this, ideal internal properties. So maybe ideal thought would fall into that sort of category. So I put Aristotle up there as our representative. Okay, so we have these four quadrants. Now, the first point I wanna make is that I think these are not really different answers in my view, they're actually different questions. And a lot of the arguments you find about artificial intelligence, or about what intelligence is, and they go round and round in circles, people are actually in different quadrants here. And so one person might be interested in creating some system that has internal properties that are like a human. So it has maybe experiences, human-like emotions or thought or whatever you, whatever you have, where somebody else might, might not care. At the end of the day, you know, they go and ask the machine and it, it comes up with a cure for cancer or something or other. They don't care whether the machine understood cancer. The point is it came up with a cure. That's all they care about. They don't care whether it has some internal realization of it, whether it's, you know, whatever internal properties it has, they just don't care. Um, so, yeah, so that's, so that's, I think that's a very important thing when you start arguing about this, is to identify where you belong, where other people belong. You'll find arguments going on and on and on forever, 
And people just are actually talking about different things, and they're trying to answer different questions. And there's perfectly valid reasons why you might want to do some of these things. I mean, if you just want to solve a whole lot of problems, you might want something, a machine down here that does, solves problems for you and does stuff. If you want to upload yourself into a machine, you're probably concerned about whether there's going to be consciousness in, in the machine when you're uploaded. So you might want to answer this type of question. Okay, now I am going to answer the bottom, the bottom right here. That's the perspective I'm going to take. That's the question I'm trying to answer. And I'm not dismissing the other ones, but that's what I'm going for. So I just want to clear that up. And I think if you keep this in mind when you have these debates, that, that's a good starting point. Right, so where, 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 where should you begin if you're trying to define intelligence in some really concrete way? Well, one possibility is, obvious possibility is to start with a, a whole lot of definitions of intelligence. So I put together... I believe the world's biggest collection of definitions of intelligence. I have like nearly 80, I think. Um, and what I found was that a lot of them, there are, people say there are as many definitions of intelligence as there are people who define it, basically. Um, but that's not quite true. What you actually find is there are definite clusters within the space, and I believe there is a dominant cluster as well. And so, I'm going to shoot for that dominant cluster, and I'm going to run you through a few definitions from that cluster, just four of them. I, I could go on all day about them, but <laughs> I haven't got all day. Okay, so first of all, um, here's one definition. Intelligent systems are expected to work and work well in many different environments. So there are a few key things here already. Okay, so they're expected to work. So they actually do something, okay, and they have to do it well. So there's some notion of success or failure or you're achieving something, right? Some kind of goal that you have to have. And then it's in many different environments. So if you're going to be intelligent, and in in, in, in what they, I guess what they really mean is some sort of general intelligence, is that you have to be general, right? You've got to, you can't just be a one-trick pony. You've got to be able to deal with all different kinds of possibilities and all sorts of things, right? Okay, bring up another one. Um, cluster of cognitive abilities that lead to successful adaption to a wide range of environments. Again, wide range of environments. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be able to deal with lots of different possibilities, and you have to, you have to adapt, because you don't know the environment in advance, right? You could be given a problem, a, a new game you've never seen before, or something or other, and you've got you to solve it. So you've got to learn, and you've got to adapt, so that you can deal with a wide range of environments. Successful. Again, there's some notion of success. There's some sort of goal or something you're trying to achieve in your interaction with the environment. Okay, bring up another one. Ability of a system to act appropriately in an uncertain environment where appropriate action is that which increases the probability of success. You can see the same things coming through again. You've got, you got an idea of success here, um, the uncertain environment, so you don't know the environment in advance, you've got to deal with lots of possibilities. Same thing again. Okay, any system that generates adaptive behavior, again, you have to adapt. To meet goals, you've got to have some sort of goal, some notion of success, and a range of environments. So that's just four definitions, and you see there's a clear, there's, there's a lot of commonality between them. They're saying a lot of the same stuff. So, first of all, I would say that intelligence, defined in, in this way from the sort of cluster of definitions that we see, first of all, it's a property of some sort of agent. It interacts with an environment so as to successfully achieve goals across a wide range of environments. And I think these are four very basic fundamental things that you see coming through in a lot of definitions. And they're quite simple ideas. Now, you can... So what, I'd, what I wanted to do is I wanted to come up with a, a formal definition of intelligence, right? I wanted to really nail this down so I can start, you know, measuring how smart my algorithms are and stuff. Um, and I looked at that, and you can, you can sort of define, you can define all these things. It's actually not too hard um, once you've got the necessary background and math and, and reinforcement learning and a few other bits and pieces. Um, but there's something missing. And the question is, if you want an overall measure of performance... How do you weight the performance in every different environment? Because there's an infinite number of environments, possibly. So you have to find some way to weight them. And the solution appears to be the following. Here's a simple number sequence. This is, 
this was a number sequence. Well, it would be, if it was in an IQ test, it would be a very simple question in an IQ test. Um, but it's just to illustrate the point here. So you could be in a, sitting in an IQ test, you see the sequence, and you think, ah, oh, what happens? What's, what's the next? What's the correct answer? Well, maybe the rule is 2n minus 1. So it's basically just counting through the odd numbers, right? Okay, another possibility. Maybe it's this equation. Now, if you actually, if you want to do the math, you see when n is 1, that goes to 0, so that factors out, that, that goes to 0. When it's 2, that goes to 0, that 3. And then once it's gone past this, the whole thing then, so it's just following this rule to start with, then it jumps up to 33. So maybe the correct answer to this is 33, right? Because, you know, we have a rule that explains all the data we have. No, that's wrong. You'll fail your IQ test. <laughs> so why is it, given that both of these work for all the data we have, why is it this is considered the right answer? It's a philosophical principle called Occam's razor. And basically what it says is, there are many different explanations of things, but the most likely one is probably the simplest one. It could be one, you could be wrong, it can be one of the other ones. It's not an absolute rule, but as a sort of a heuristic, when you see a pattern, the simplest explanation of what you're seeing is probably the right explanation. And so that's called Occam's razor. So we now have our four things here that we originally had, and we have Occam's razor added to it. And now, we have enough to go and formalize this definition. We have all the bits we require. So, ta-da! Here is an equation for intelligence. <laughs> so, yeah, as, as much as I'd like to declare victory at this point, you know, we sort of have to, uh, <laughs> we have to kind of analyze it a bit and see if it works and so on. So, that's where we're going to go next. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this equation. Um, I can't explain it completely because then I'd have to explain a whole lot of stuff that I'd love to explain to you, but it'd take like an hour. So we're not going to quite go there, but I'm going to I'm run you through the basic idea. Okay, so first of all, we have an agent, and that's pi. And technically, that's a conditional probability measure for those who are into your math. And that's a very, very, very general way of expressing these things. Next up, we have an environment. And this is this guy here. Now, remember the list on the previous, uh, the previous slide. We had agent, environment, all those things. I'm going to go through each of those and show it turning up on this equation, right? So it's the same thing. It's just all the bits defined formally and put all together, right? Okay. So next of all, we have some notion of success. This is in a reinforcement learning framework. That's the technical name for it. And basically, V pi mu is how well this agent is performing when interacting with this environment, okay? Um, next of all, we need a wide range of environments, remember? So, this is this down here. Mu, our environment, belongs to E, which is a wide range of environments. Here, it's sort of the, the class of all computable environments where they can be stochastic. So, it's, it's very, very general. I mean, quantum physics, the wave equation is Turing computable. So, Contains everything in the universe as far as we know. So it's extremely general. When I say wide range of environments, that's really crazy wide, right? Because I wanted the most general definition possible. Okay, and then we have this big ugly brute up here. Ta da That's Occam's razor. Okay, so, so remember, I was, Occam's razor, the idea is the, um, the explanation, or what, what you're guessing what's going on in the environment, is to do with how complex it is, right? So this here is the environment, this is the Kolmogorov complexity function, and we're measuring the complexity of the environment. And it's 2 to the negative, so when it's more complex, the weighting goes down, and vice versa. And so that's, that's Occam's razor. Okay, so we've just taken all those bits, and we've just formalized it and put it in an equation. So, what properties does this equation have? Turns out it has quite a number of nice properties. So, first of all, pretty obvious, it's formally defined. Now, that's actually quite a radical thing. If you look around in the literature, nobody formally defines intelligence, basically. They say, oh, intelligence is, I don't know, um, the ability to be creative and responsive to your needs, or I don't know, whatever. And that's a really hard thing to nail down. When you go like, well, okay, if that's the definition of intelligence, and I've just written this Q lambda algorithm, how intelligent is that? Uh, I don't know. You need something a lot more precise, and I've given you an equation. So even if you 
hate my definition, you have to accept the fact that I've, said, I've actually defined it formally and said exactly what I mean. And I think that's a very good start. At least we can argue on that basis. So, next up, it captures the essence of many informal definitions. I showed you how there's all these informal definitions, there's all these commonalities, I can write them down mathematically and put them together. So there's actually a connection between the equation and what a lot of people, psychologists, AI researchers, and all these people have actually said about intelligence. So there's a connection back into that literature, right? Another point. So if you look at it theoretically, you can figure out that it or correctly orders simple agents. So you can measure the intelligence of the most trivial learning algorithms you can imagine. And you can actually start to distinguish between them and actually see the difference in intelligence, theoretically. Now, at the other end, that's really getting interesting. There's this model called AIXC. And you, that guy down the bottom on the right before Marcus Hutter, he developed uh, this theoretically optimal model of artificial intelligence. It requires infinite computing power and so on and so on. Um, so not the most practical in its, you know, in its theoretical form. Um, but you can prove that it converges to optimal performance in any environment where this is possible for a general agent. So that's pretty impressive performance. Um, and what happens is that this intelligence measure is, is set up in such a way that as your intelligence, according to that equation, goes up and up and up and up and up and up, you actually confer, converge to AIXC. So you converge to the system with universally optimal performance. And so what that means is that between this thing and this thing, the intelligence measure spans an incredible range from these theoretical incomputable models of optimal everything all the way down to the most simple, trivial learning algorithm you can imagine. So it's a massive spread here. It seems to cover theoretically everything. It's a continuous measure. Now that's really important because the Turing test, you basically just pass it or you fail it. And at the moment, nobody can pass it. And so we don't really know whether we're going forwards or what, right? It's sort of this binary kind of thing. What we want to know is, well, okay, so our algorithm's pretty dumb, but if we add this thing into it, it's still pretty dumb, but it's a little bit smarter. We're kind of going in the right direction. And that's really, really useful information because it can guide your research. Okay. Now, it's also non-anthropocentric. So you don't need a panel of judges like the Turing test. Um, you don't need some sort of subjective whatever there. Um, it's formally defined, and it's just, it all comes down to just pure mathematics, complexity theory, that kind of thing. Um, now, given that it's, doesn't, it's not anthropocentric and it's formally defined, this is, you know, this is all nice in theory, but we actually want to do something in practice, right? We actually want to use the thing. So, what we want to do, in other words, is build this graph, right? Because we've done all this theory stuff, and it's, it's got some ugly incomputable bits and so on in there, but we want this graph. So, a lot of people have said, well, you know, it's a bit questionable, it's all very nice, you did this in theory, but um, we want an actual test we can use. Great. So that was what I started to work on next. And this is what I've been working on at the moment. And I've been furiously working on it, um, particularly in the last week, because I really wanted to uh, actually have some results. <laughs> so I do have some results, um, and uh, very preliminary results, and when you read the end paper, I might have changed some things around. But the remarkable thing was that I took the basic equation, I took the basic idea. There were a number of difficulties, but it, they turned out to be actually relatively straightforward. And so myself and a colleague, Joel Vaness, uh, implemented it up, and our first implementation seems to work great. That really happens in research, as any scientist here will know. So it seems that the basic theoretical idea once you sort of think through the implement, how to implement that idea in a sensible way, it seems to work. So what we've got here is, um, oh, and I've called this, by the way, algorithmic intelligence quotient. Um, so 
What we've got here is we have a number of different agents. I just performed this quick test here. So we've got a random agent, and the way it's set up, um, it, it, it's, it's going to get a score of zero. So that's sort of a nice baseline, right? Um, then I have a simple, what I call a frequency agent. So I need a really, really dumb learning algorithm. And so basically, it just looks at the frequency of what actions turned out to produce some kind of success, counts them up, and does what seems to be working. Um, then there's a more sophisticated algorithm called uh, Q0. I won't go into that, but I need to say it's more sophisticated. Then there's this big brother, Q lambda. And then there's Q lambda with function approximators, and that's more advanced. So if you asked any, peop any AI people, they would tell you that these are the best ones going down to, well, random, which is just, you know, it's about the worst you can do other than deliberately trying to do the wrong thing. So I ran the test, and what are the results? It ordered it perfectly. That was, <laughs> I, was uh, I was rather pleased to see this, I have to say. Um, and it really wasn't too hard. We've tried a few variants on the basic idea, and so far they all work. So it's quite encouraging that, that while we're going to tweak it as we keep working on this research, and this is preliminary research, I mean, it's literally some of these numbers were computed last night on a, on a, <laughs> on a guy's computer. Um, seems to be working great. So that's sort of a basic sanity test that at least so far in the different algorithms we've, we've, we've tried it on, it's, it's giving us exactly the answers we would expect to see. Um, we performed another test. Um, and this is trying to, this is a little bit more in the spirit of the graph that I'd like to see. So down the bottom here, well, so we have something called Monte Carlo AIC. And it's a, it's a very powerful learning agent. It approximates this universally optimal AIC by doing Monte Carlo sampling and some stuff like this. Um, it's pretty neat. You can pick some simple game, tic-tac-toe, po different types of poker, Pac-Man, a whole bunch of different things. If you fire it up on a cluster, the latest version can learn to play any of those games. No programming. No parameter setting in 30 minutes. It just learns it. It's pretty cool. So this is, this is my collaborator that I'm working on with the intelligence test stuff with, Joel Vaness. Right, so, so this is the context depth down here. So this is basically um, the size of the model that's building of the world. That, so it's sort of brain capacity in some sense. Um, and this here is its measured algorithmic uh, intelligence quotient, and it does exactly what we hoped it would. So when you have basically uh, a brain that only just sort of exists, your model is very, very small, you have very, very low performance. It's basically just above random. You increase it up a bit, it jumps up here. You increase it way over here, it goes over here. Uh, we've done another test where we vary the amount of computation you have. So you can sort of search more and do more Monte Carlo simulations, and we say, see the same behavior. Uh, I would have more data points if we had faster computers. <laughs> but so far, it's working well, and we did confidence intervals and everything, and it's, it's significant. OK. So I think, this is, um, I think this is a very important question to try to answer, trying to define what intelligence is and being able to measure it. I think it's important theoretically because it gives us some clarity and some and a mental model for thinking about the problem, which we can then use to try to attack the problem and figure out how to solve the problem. And I think it's very important experimentally as well because we can then take um, an, an algorithm we're working on we can then modify it in some way, add something new to it, run an experiment overnight, and actually see how it's changing, how its intelligence is changing. And so one of the things I'm going to be doing soon is my colleague Demis Hassabis was speaking the other day, is we're going to be taking these Monte Carlo AXC models, and we're actually we're looking at ways to bring in ideas from theoretical neuroscience where we understand some of the subsystems of the brain. So we can drop this into the system, and we can actually then measure how it's impacting the intelligence. Another thing you can do is once you have this basic setup, you can then slice and dice it in all sorts of different ways. So you can say, well, what's its intelligence of a certain kind of intelligence? Or certain, you can, you know, cut it, you can cut it up all sorts of different ways and ask all sorts of quite subtle questions rather than just an overall intelligence measure. So 
I want to leave you with this uh, last quote here. Um, if you cannot measure it, then it is not science. And I think in artificial intelligence, if we want to be a science, we have to clear up artificial intelligence. What is this thing? We've got to define what it is we're talking about, what we're trying to achieve in order to really attack the problem effectively. Finally, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Marcus Huta, my PhD supervisor who did all the AIC theoretical work and uh, worked with me on the theoretical definition, and then Joel Vaness, who's doing the Monte Carlo AC, and he's working with me on the uh, practical intelligence measurement, and then um, my, the group supporting me, Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit, University College London, and the Swiss National Science Foundation. Thank you. So um, can you talk a little bit about how you get from the behavior of some, quote, intelligent algorithm to the inputs of your sort of metric algorithm that you described? How you get from the behavior to the? Right, so if you're trying to use your algorithm to measure yeah. the intelligence based on the behavior of, of some system. That, that's a 50-page paper. <laughs> well, in the, in, the, in the results you showed us, like, wh what did you actually do? Yeah, that's a 50-page paper. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, okay, how do I try to answer that? Um, so, so it's a reinforcement setup. Um, so we, ha we, what, we, we, we sample from a space of environments. We have a, a basically a, sort of like a metaphysics, which is defined by a universal re uh, Turing machine. It's very, very simple. We sample from a space of environments, and then we basically do a Monte Carlo sample to see its expected performance, as, as the equation defines. But yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff in there. So, so come to me and ask me later. I'm happy to discuss it, but it's just a 50-page paper, that's all. Mm. Hi, Peter. Hi, Shane. Good stuff. Um, maybe it's, well, it's kind of an extension to the same question. Uh, how many environments did you actually have in your tests? And were, were these environments just totally randomly generated? They're randomly sampled, yeah. Yeah, they're randomly mm. sampled. And to get reasonable uh, confidence intervals, we were needing over a thousand environments. Um, but, at, but what it seems is that as the intelligence of the agent goes up, <clears throat> the subtlety it sort of becomes more and more subtle, and you need to sample more and more environments, so it becomes harder. But um, there are all sorts of tricks and things you can start doing. You can do stratified sampling and do all sorts of clever things to try to push it up. And we can also put bounds on the complexity so you can say, well, we're not going to worry about the simple ones, we're going to target some subset of the more intelligent ones, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, what is the theoretical measure, the, the top measure, what, what is the highest number? Um, it's not computable. So we don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Shane, it's Peter van der Meijt. Um, I have a question about evolving intelligence as, uh, as a f function of learning. The um, one, one, one uh, measure of intelligence is to learn and apply knowledge. I'm mes missing in your equation, which is very nice, I'm missing the, um, uh, the learning function. The learning? Yes. <clears throat> you have to learn because you have to be able to deal with a wide range of environments. So yeah. as the agent, you just get thrown in some sort of environment and you have to start, you have no idea what it is, and you have to start learning and adapting to it. So that's already built in. That's built in. Yeah. Um, so a question, have you considered or have you already uh, used your um, algorithmic intelligence quotient on a human? Or would it be possible? <laughs> so th this is very recent research. Um, Joel, <laughs> the programmer, tried playing around with it. And <clears throat> it's kind of fun, actually. What you see is all sorts of little very, very simple. I mean, to start with, you see lots of like static environments. They're not really doing anything. They're the simplest environments. And then you see environments that are what they call bandits, technically. And that's basically, you have like a number of buttons. You push different buttons and you get different rewards for them. And you have to figure out which buttons to push. And it can be stochastic as well. Then you see Markov decision processes, sequence prediction problems, and all these things. And Joel could solve some of them very trivially. Some of them he had to really think about hard for a few minutes and interact to figure out what it was doing. Some of them he would have to go and look at the program because he couldn't understand it without actually reading the program, so it was just too hard. And some of them he couldn't even understand when he looked at the program. So, so you can see it has a scale from very simple up to beyond whatever Joel can do. Did, did you actually score his? 
we uh, attempt? No, we haven't scored them because it, as uh, Peter Voss asked, it takes like over a thousand samples and Joel got bored. <laughs> <laughs> so. Hi. You know. <laughs> Your thoughts on the following. Um, so you can map humans to their intelligence quotient using like maybe someone's a 60, 140 example, for example. Yeah. Having, using the Turing test for these AIs and having them test against a very various levels of human IQs. For example, you might be able to trick a toddler that you're a human versus not like a genius. Right, right. That's one of the ideas of making the Turing test a bit more continuous in right. some way. But <clears throat> so far, it doesn't seem to work very well. Toddlers are actually very smart. So is I mean, really, bot. toddlers can run around and pick things up and argue with you and all sorts of things. They're actually very, very sophisticated systems, and our algorithms really don't approach that at all. So even if you scale it from an adult in a Turing test down to a toddler, it, you still have the same kind of problem. Thanks. Uh, I wonder if you could, this is very nice, I think. I wonder if you could say anything about uh, the relationship of AIQ and Cisco learning theory. Things like VC dimension, I would have guessed, would be closely related. Um, um, and also, ooh. if there's any limitations in the approximation that I imagine you're making to compute AIQ since... Yeah, so the first question, I don't know. Uh, that, that's pretty technical. I haven't thought about it. Um, um, and the second, sorry, the second question was the... Um, I don't know if you can oh, analytically compute AIQ, but you're... I'm guessing you're approximating it, and yeah, I wonder yeah, what yeah. the limitations are of those approximations. Yeah, so the theoretical definition is over all possible environments weighted, and we can't do all possible environments, so we just take a Monte Carlo sim, sim, uh, sample. We just take a sample, and that's what Peter was asking. And it's like, after about a thousand, for this, for this level of intelligence, we're getting um, statistically significant answers. So, yeah, we take a finite sample. One more question, Shane? Sure. Um, I had a, a sort of a two-part question. I, I've been working in psychometrics, which is actually measuring human mm -hmm. beings um, in terms of their acquisition of knowledge and understanding. And there's a huge difference in um, even the order in which people occur when you define environment one way versus defining environment yes. another way. Yes. So I, I think it's going to be interesting to say, you know, how do we come up with a universal definition of environment so that we can actually compare systems, your systems versus someone else's? Right. Um, so it's not really, I think the problem is not really a universal definition of environments. We can do that. The question is <clears throat> how you weight those different environments in yeah. that universal space. Right, so which and, one matters? Yeah, yeah now this is, a, this is a major issue in the whole area. Um, and that's, what, that's the thing I've struggled with the most. And what I've found so far is that in practice, our, our, when we use a simple uni a reference machine, mm -hmm. so it's a very simple computational structure, it doesn't seem to matter too much. The, the, we, get the, we get consistent answers across them. Um, there are reasons why you might want to use a more complex reference machine so it's a bit more like the real world. So what this type of test stresses is problems that have a simple sort of computational structure. Right, so the simple environments, essentially. It's yeah. simple in that sense. Right. Now, you could have a reference machine that's a little bit more like the f world we live in, right? right. Or actually, like, completely like the world we live in. Right. Um, and then that's much more, in some sense, humans would be much more tuned to it because we're tuned to that sort of, those statistics of the world. Well, I think the challenge is going to be keeping a stable scale as our definition of environment changes. Um, yeah, so what I think of it yeah. is you actually basically have a, a, a scale from the most elementary reference machines to a full blown simulation of the world. And you need to, need to and report you have that different, as well. You have sort of different flavors of test along that. Right. But actually, as your performance goes up in all of them, right. because of the theoretical properties, you still converge to this AIXC universally optimal thing. So you still right. have, and you see that with humans, that humans can program computers. And right. when they're programming a computer, they've actually gone all the way to the point of Turing completeness, and now they're working in completely abstract computational spaces. So we're already right. able to go far enough up that sort of scale that yeah. the, these effects start kicking well, in. The, the other, the other challenge all right, guys, that's all we have time for. Thank Thanks. you very much. All right. Thank you. Mr. Shanleg, everyone. <laughs>